grâce. Oui, grâce. Yes, before even starting, I will risk these two words of grace, grâce. First word, grace. Second word, grace. Grâce, grâce. In order to attest to my gratitude, indeed, but also in order to vow while asking for grace. I would like to render thanks, grâce, mercy, therefore, and also to ask for your forgiveness, grâce. Rendering thanks to those who have granted me the redoubtable honor of speaking, assigning me, as if by the privilege of an election, a task to which I will always feel unequal. I would also ask for forgiveness and for use as well, asking that one forgive what I will soon avow. I will dare say to use my avowal as a pretext in order to put forth a general proposition, the formal hypothesis that I submit to your discussion. Which one? Well, today, and I do say today, for those one calls contemporaries, for those who one thinks in a supposed synchrony live together, vivent ensemble, the historical now of a given time Today, therefore, in the same world, facing responsibilities, be they ethical, juridical, religious, and beyond, named by what we call in so obscure a fashion in our language, vivre ensemble, living together. Well, there are certain vow itself as the first commandment the first commandment. This is not just any avowal, but a singular, unheard of, and improbable avowal. An avowal that, prior to and beyond any determined fault, declares before the one, before the other, the unavowable. For to avow what seems easy to avow, to avow the avowable, let us recognize, would not be to avow. Let us avow that. The avowal, if there is one, must avow the unavowable, and must therefore declare it. The avowal would have to declare, where it, where it possible, the unavowable, that is to say, the unjust, the unjustifiable, the unforgivable, and even the impossibility of avowing. In the same manner, to forgive only what that which is forgivable, venial, would not be to forgive. An avowal, if there is such, must avow the unavowable. And forgiveness, if there, is, if there is such, must forgive the unforgivable, and must therefore do the impossible. If such were the condition of living together, it will command doing the impossible. I do not yet know whether declaring, manifesting, confessing, or avowing the unavowable already supposes the repentance or the return of some teshuva, as we say in Hebrew, to mean return, repentance, and so on and so forth. An immense enigma against whose background the globalization of the scene of avowal today presents itself. Everywhere there is a theatrical process of a return to the most proximate or to the most distant past, 
often with repentance and forgiveness, ask for a process of reparation, indemnification, or reconciliation. However well interpreted, this globalization of avowal and of repentance perhaps affects or already signifies, like an announcement or like a symptom, a certain mutation of the living together. Thus would resonate the first commandment, be it impractic impracticable, dictated by all living together. I will not use this word commandment lightly, but here is the first vowel before beginning to justify this word of commandment with regard to a living together. And I will do nothing here but prepare myself until the very end to begin again, for there can be no living together that is not devoted to this return, this going back upon oneself or back over one's steps this repetition of inaugurality. What is new concerning forgiveness and concerning what the scheme of forgiveness implies and engages of a living together. Um, choosing me for this encounter, namely how to live together um, comment vivre ensemble. I vow that I now live differently with these close and familiar words which say something about close ones, about the neighbor and the proximate. Ils disent quelque chose des proches et des prochains, du prochain, about familiarity itself and even about family. What is a neighbor, a proche? When one knows that no known proximity, above all, not that of space and time, suffices to define my close ones, and even less so my neighbor. My neighbor can be a stranger and a foreigner, any other or wholly other, tout autre, living very far from me in space and time. This truth has not had to wait for television or cell telephone. These words, to live together and how, have thus not ceased to accompany me in their very familiarity more and more strange, foreign, becoming for me more and more strange, foreign, enigmatic. Living together. Yes, but what does that mean? Even before knowing how, is it bo not both a simple evidence? How could one live otherwise? And on the contrary, the promise always of the inaccessible, suspended in a tidal and out of context, the tone of this formula remains very unstable. Following the virtual phrases, phrases that incline it toward one side or the other, it oscillates between a tone of practical serenity and an accent of tragic pathos between philosophical wisdom and desperate anguish. The wise teaches us, given that living is always living together and that it must be so, let us only learn how to live together. Let us determine rules, norms, maxims, precepts, 
even in ethical, juridical, and political jurisprudence. But despair, protests, and replies, but how? How to live together? I will not, you will not, or he or she will not, we will not, you will not, they will not achieve it ever. And the variation of these persons speaks also a deeper paradox as to the same concern. Who addresses whom in asking how to live together? Or still, does not living together take place from the, the instant that the concern over this question makes us tremble in our solitude and a vow, yes, a vow, and share it. In a kind of discreet and discontinuous meditation, these two words living together, the couple of words that go together, that go well together while letting us think of an impossible marriage. One often says of unwed couples, these two live together. These two words, therefore, have both harassed and abandoned me like two words that go together without closing themselves up in a togetherness an ensemble or a gathering and already there announces itself between the adverb together ensemble and the noun the ensemble l'ensemble the adverb together ensemble and the noun l'ensemble the ensemble a divorce of which i will make much I will repeatedly refer to Emmanuel Levinas, uh, <coughs> another way of recalling at the moment when I want to salute the name of the admired friend, that one can live together with the dead. This will be my conclusion in a moment, when I will return finally to Jerusalem and tell you about my first visit to the cemetery of this city, the whole of which, dans l'ensemble, the being together of which, l'être ensemble, of this city, remains to be thought. Living together with the dead is not an accident a miracle or an extraordinary story. It is rather an essential possibility of existence. It reminds us that in living together, the idea of life is not, is neither simple nor dominant, even if it remains irreducible. Living together with the past of those who are no longer <coughs> and will not be present or living, or with the, the unpredictable future to come, avenir, of those who are not yet living in the present. If this constitutes an indisputable possibility of the being with oneself, être avec soi, of a living together with oneself, in a self thus shared or divided, enclosed, multiplied, or torn, open, open to, in any, in any case, anachronistic in its very presence, at once increased and dislocated by the mourning of the promise, or the promise of the other in oneself, a larger, Order 
or younger other than oneself, and other outside of oneself, in oneself. Then, living together no longer has the simplicity of a living in the present pure and simple, no more than the cohesiveness, the self-coincidence of a present whole, an ensemble présent, living present, the Bendiger Gegenwart, present to itself, synchronous with itself, conjoined with itself in a kind of totality. The alterity of irreducible past and futures withdraws, soustrait, the living together from the plenitude of a presence to self or from an identity. In order to attempt to think what living together might mean, ce que peut vouloir dire vivre ensemble, one must therefore take into account what occurs, I mean, ce qui arrive, to that which is called the proximity of the other in the present, and not only by way of technology, from television to internet, or cell phones, or air communications, or satellites. The alterity of past and future, the irreducible experience of memory and of the promise, of mourning and hope, all suppose some rupture, the interruption of this identity or of this totality, of this accomplishment of a presence to self, a fracturing of openness in what one calls an ensemble, an ensemble, a whole gathering ensemble, with the noun ensemble, ensemble, which I will distinguish again from the verb ensemble in the expression vivre ensemble, living together. This cannot be without consequences of all kinds, and not only ethical, juridical, or political, as to what we must meditate on together, ensemble. The adverb in the expression living together, the adverb appears to find its sense and dignity only there where it exceeds, dislocates, contests the authority of the noun ensemble. To wit, the closure of an ensemble, be it the whole of something living, un vivant, of a system, a totality, a cohesiveness, without fault and identical with itself, of an indivisible element containing itself in its immanence and simply larger, like the whole, the two, larger than its parts. The authority of the whole, of the, the l'ensemble, will always, always be the first threat for all living together. The together, as the noun, the ensemble, will always be the first threat for all living together with the other. And inversely, all living together will be the first protestation or the first contestation, the first testimony against the whole, l'ensemble. I would judge it irresponsible to efface in simple politeness my signature, that of a Jewish intellectual for whom living together with a non-Jewish world was no more serious or more urgent a problem than that of living together with all the forms of what one calls the Jewish communities of the world.
the Arab, uh, the, uh, first of all, for my generation, the Algerian community, the Algerian communities, the Arab, Berber, French of Algeria, French of France communities, Israeli community, Israeli communities, and beyond. If I trust what remains for me indisputable and undeniable, to which, and I am Jewish, not, I am first of all Jewish, but I am already and since forever Jewish, and I will it at all costs. These experience of the irrevocable has always tolerated and even demanded an infinite uncertainty, infinite uncertainty regarding what might be meant or involved by a living together in a Jewish community. And first of all, with oneself as Jewish and with oneself in general. In uh, its French idiom, how to live together in the infinitive and without determined subject, a verb plus an adverb. We hear in the brevity of its sententious ellipsis the imperious reminder, the rappel, of what remains an ineluctable necessity, even a vital necessity. One must live together. Il faut vivre ensemble. Together with the adverb together, the infinitive to live enjoins, it gives at least an implicit assertion live together, one must, one must well live together. Il faut bien vivre ensemble. In any case, in any case, in any fashion, live together one must. And one must do so well. One must well do so. Il le faut bien. Il le faut, il le faut bien. This uh, must, il faut, like the well of the one must well can be modulated in any on and all keys. The connotation of the living together are distributed from the best to the worst by way of the last resort. Here an inaccessible ideal, there a fatality that itself can be experienced as good, neutral, or infernal. The best of the living together is often associated with peace, peace, an enigmatic concept, if ever there was one. And I would have liked to have the time for a patient meditation on peace from Kant to Levinas, a perpetual peace or a messianic peace whose promise belongs to the very concept of peace and suffices to distinguish it from armistice, from ceasefire, or even from peace process, peace processes. Palestinians and Israelis will live truly together only on the day when peace, not only armistice, not only ceasefire, not only peace process, they will, Palestinians and Israelis, will live truly together only on the day when peace comes into bodies and souls, when what is necessary will have been done by those who have the power for it, or who quite simply have the most power, state power, economic, military, national or international power, to take the initiative of peace in a manner that is first of all wisely unilateral. At bottom, the question of which I will speak tonight 
could be summarized as a question of initiative in a vowel. Who takes or who must take the initiative? And to whom falls the charge of the unilateral decision before all exchange and all reciprocity to come in the approach of peace or of reconciliation. But another connotation of the bien vivre ensemble, well lived together, that of the last resort, does not wait for peace. It is that of the one must well live together, il faut bien vivre ensemble, one cannot do otherwise, one has no choice. It is indeed always a matter of necessity, and therefore of a law. One cannot not live together, even if one does not know how or with whom, with God, with God's men, animals, with one's own, with one's close ones, neighbors, family, or friends, with one's fellow citizens or countrymen, but also with the most distant strangers, with one's enemies, with oneself, with one's contemporaries, with those who are no longer so, or will never be so. So many names that I draw from daily language and of which I do not yet presume that we know what they designate. But we sense that the regime, the regimes of this law of the must il faut and therefore of the well, one must well live together, can be different. We know, and the, this example will not surprise you, but I could substitute it with so many others. We know that Israelis and Palestinians, Israelis and Arabs of the Middle East, already must, they must well live together, whether they are or not for peace now, whether they are not, they are or not orthodox, as one says strangely. And the same goes for the Israelis and for all the Jews of the diaspora. This name, diaspora, which arbitrarily places them in one ensemble, the diaspora. Whether they want it or not, be it under the category of dispersion. Whether they are believers or not, favoring or not what one calls the peace process agreeing or not with those who here or there concur, concur in order in good conscience or cynically to sabotage the same process. Well then, all of these, all of these, they must well live together. Now, they live together, Israelis and Palestinians, even if they are at war. So in the inflections, of what we declare here as our language, these one must well, of the one must well live together, can therefore have heterogeneous values to the point of incompatibility. Incompatibility, and at least two. On the one hand, one must well can announce that one will have to live badly, mal, together, in hatred or in war, which are also matters of living, even of dying together, in the same space and the same time, in lack of trust, indifference, or resignation to fatality, as when one suggests sometimes that short of authentic peace, Israel and the countries of the Middle East must well coexist, cohabitate, cooperate, collaborate. War, called war or not, 
Cold War, even apartheid, but also peaceful coexistence, the cohabitation of adversaries, are all forms of the one must well live together. They present them themselves at this time in a non fortuitous manner, major and conflictual stakes that divide the French community as to living together. Beyond the thousand problems of Europe and of social justice, in a sharper fashion, fashion yet, three fundamental questions of living together put this cohabitation to test today. Questions that are no longer only French, but to which Jews are particularly sensitive. The question of hospitality to foreigners, immigrants with or without permits, and it's also a Californian question. The question of civil union, what one calls Pax in French, is a way of living together legally without being married. That's a new law called Pax. And of marriage, of course. The question of national memory. Uh, come, all these questions come to unsettle the most reassuring and the most consensual foundations that are, however, non-natural, constructed and fragile foundations of the national living together. It is true that even in these negative hypotheses of the one must as well live together, the common value of higher interests is accepted by the partners, even the enemies, to wit that it is better to live than to die. Living, surviving, would then be, in this hypothesis, the unconditional imperative, as problematic as it uh, remains. Even if this cohabitation is resigned, armed, organized, at times guaranteed by a contract, a constitution, and some institutional jurisprudence, it answers to a common and therefore higher interest. And this calculation supposes at least three actions that are at once powerful and fragile. Three actions. First, one cannot not suppose that this rezoned cohabitation represents a temporary situation destined to save the promise of an avenir, a future, and that the avenir of this avenir should keep the figure of a living together free of these negative limits, of this statutory surveillance. An authentic peace to come, a peace without end or infinite, remains a quasi-messianic horizon of this armed, armed peace or of this armistice. What is here for communities, nations, or states can be valid also for families or individuals. Second action. One cannot not suppose some consensus as to what living means. And that is, it is worth more and better than dying, which is far from self-evident. No more than it is self-evident that some forms of dying do not figure a certain manner of living together. Dying together in the same place and at the same moment for those whom Montaigne called the co-dying, les co-mourants, the ones who die together. Some can see here the supreme ordeal of living together. So what does same mean in these expressions? Here is the enigma that I do not yet touch on. 
third, third axiom. One cannot not suppose that each partner of this coexistence of, of this cohabitation should be identical to himself, should be one and together with him or her, which is far from self-evident, whether it be a matter of humanity, the nation, or the nation state, and therefore the citizen, whether it be a question of no matter what community or class of, of, of so-called civil society, or whether it be a matter quite simply of the family, of each individual, and of what one strangely calls one's close ones, or one's own, of me, of whoever, whoever says me and claims in all conscience, I mean, without taking account of some unconscious, claims in all conscience to decide and take responsibility. But, on the other hand, the syntagma, il faut bien vivre ensemble, can let itself be otherwise accented in our language and signal to a well, bien, a living well together, bien vivre ensemble, that no longer incidentally qualifies a fundamental of previous living together. Living together then means living together well, bien, according to the good, le bien, selon le bien, not only some euphoria of living, of the good life, of the savoir vivre, an art of living, but also according to a good of trust, of accord, or of concord. This good, ce bien, intrinsic to the living together, no one will reasonably think, but it is the reasonable that we interrogate here, no one will reasonably think of dissociating it from peace, from harmony, from accord and concord. If living together then means living well together, this signifies understanding one another in trust, in good faith, in faith, comprehending one another, in a word, being in accord, on accord with one another. Why then speak of accord, accord? And of the, uh, why this language of the heart, the cœur, of the accord or concord, even of mercy, misericorde, and of the compassion that must bring us closer and a bit more quickly to the question of forgiveness with or without teshuva, that is, return, repentance, and so on and so forth. The language of the heart reminds us that this peace of the living together, even if it is a peace of justice, of law, the droit, recht, national or international, or of the political contract. And here, as I often do, I will distinguish, and that was a question raised this afternoon, I will distinguish without, that without opposing them, justice, justice and law. La justice et le droit. Non pas la justice et la loi, mais la justice et le droit. Recht, right. Or the French idiom. One says, for example, of the partners of a couple, man and woman, man and man, woman and woman, that they live together when outside of the law or the instituted obligations of marriage, even of a civil union, Pax, they decide freely and 
out of a common accord to share their life, their time, the places of life, the land on earth, and sometimes with the time and the land of their history, with their memory and their mourning, the avenir, future of a generation, children engendered or adopted by them, men and women. And my allusion to the French problem of Pax. Not that living together demands a rupture with the normality of the law of law and with marriages, with marriage. Spouses can live together and legality does not exclude living well together. But even in the cases of the most reassuring juridical normality, with or without civil union, there is a living well together, not only to the extent that something which I will elliptically call here the heart, the love, or peace of the heart, the science, faith, accord or concord, exceeds, exceeds the contract guaranteed by law or state legislation. Even if there is such a marriage, legal marriage, there is a bien vivre ensemble only if something of the heart exceeds the law, exceeds the legal contract. And so, if some ethics of living together thus appears to be implied by the idiomatic language, the idiomatic usage that I content myself for now with analyzing, it supposes a call beyond any statutory condition of a, uh, not necessarily in contradiction with it, but beyond and across the normality of a legal, political, and state control bind between two or more than one, male or female, who are not only spouses, co-citizens, co-countrymen, congeners, or co-religionist individuals, but remain strangers from others and radically other. The peace of living together, therefore, exceeds the juridical, even the political, at any rate. The political as determined by the state, by the sovereignty of the state. This living together, even where it is irreducible to the statutory or uh, institutional bond, juridical, political, control. This living together opens another dimension to the same necessity. And that is why I have spoken of the other, of the stranger, of the hospitality to the holy other who exceeds the statutory convention. The good, the good of the living well together supposes the interruption of the natural and as well um, the, uh, 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 the interruption of the conventional relation. It supposes the interruption, the interruption of the natural as well as conventional relation. It supposes even this interruption period, to cool, interruption, that one calls absolute solitude, solitude separation, inviolable secret. This separation, which was also one of the great themes of Levinas, is precisely that which opens, without contradicting, all the must, if full, of one must live together, one must well live together. Through paradoxes and aporias, about which I will even claim shortly that one must devour them, one will not say that the parts of one and the same natural, organic, and living ensemble live together. The adverb together 
in the expression leading together does not refer to the totality of a natural, biological, or genetic ensemble, to the cohesiveness of an organism or of some social body, family, ethnic group, nation, that would be measured with this organic metaphor. Living together supposes, there, therefore, an interruption or an interrupting excess, both, both with regard to statutory convention, to law, and with regard to symbi symbiosis, to a symbiotic, gregarious, of fusional living together. So an excess beyond law and nature, or nature and convention. I will go so far as to say, and this appears to me serious enough, enough not to be accepted too easily, that all living together that would limit itself to the symbi symbiotic, you see, symbiotic, or that would be regulated according to the figure of the symbiotic or the organic is a first lapse of the sense, a manquement au sens, and of the must of living together. Here is therefore a double and paradoxical, paradoxical prescription. It is inscribed in the idiom, that is to say, already in a mode of living together, what an idiom is. Living together is reducible neither to organic symbiosis nor to the juridical political contract. Neither to life, according to nature or birth, blood or soil, nor to life, according to convention, contract, or institution unless any metaphysics, any interpretation of the social bond, any political philosophy, or any sociology of being together, the old couple of physis versus nomos, uh, nature versus law, physis versus thesis, nature versus convention, biological life versus law, Etc. A law which I, di I distinguish here more than ever from justice and from the justice of living together. So there is a justice of living together which has nothing to do with the law, nor with nature, of course. One will never think the living together and the living of the living together and the how together unless one transports oneself beyond everything that is founded on this opposition of, of nature versus culture. That is to say, beyond everything, more or less everything. And this excess with regards to the laws of nature as well as to the laws of culture is always an excess with regard to the whole, the noun, l'ensemble. And I do not take the difficulty uh, lightly. It is almost unthinkable, very close to impossibility, precisely. This success does not signify that law, a non-legal law or a non-juridical justice, does not continue to command the sense and the must of the one must well live together. Which law? And can a declaring oneself Jewish in whatever mode, and there are so many, can a declaring oneself Jewish grant a privilege access to this justice, to this law beyond laws, the loi au-dessus des lois? We lack the time to develop this argument in the code of a philosophical analysis that would refer itself to universal and impersonal structures that would appeal to numerous texts under the heading of declaring oneself Jewish. 
I would rather confide in you and perhaps avow that these philosophical necessities have imposed themselves upon me through the modest experience of someone who, prior to becoming what you call a French-speaking Jewish intellectual, was first a young Jew in French Algeria, long before the independence, between three wars, that is, before, during, and after World War, uh, World War II, before, during, and after the so-called War of Algeria, in a country where the number of the, and the diversity of historical communities was as rich as in Jerusalem, west, and west to east. This Jewish child could dream of a peaceful, cultural, linguistic, and even national, plurally belonging only through the experience of non-belonging, separations, rejections, raptures, exclusions. If I did not forbid myself any lengthy first-person discourse, but is there any living together otherwise than among first persons. I would describe the contradictory movement which at the time of the anti-Semitic zeal of the French authorities in Algeria during the war pushed a little boy who was expelled from school and understood none of it to rebel forever against two ways of living together, at once against racist gregariousness and therefore against anti-Semitic segregation and any racism, but also more obscurely and more unavowably, no doubt, against the conservative and self-protective confinement of a Jewish community that seeking naturally, legitimately, to defend itself, to constitute or reconstitute its whole, son ensemble, under the ordeal of these traumas, was folding it in upon itself, overbidding in the direction that I already then felt as kind of exclusive, even fusional communitarism believing that he was beginning to understand what living together could mean, the child of which I speak had to break then in a manner that was unreflective as reflective. To break, he had to break with both sides, with both exclusive and thus excluding belongings. The only belonging, the only living together that he judged then bearable and worthy of that name, already supposed a rupture with identitarian and total totalizing belonging, assured of itself in its homogeneous whole ensemble. In a manner as unreflective as reflective, the child felt at his core In a manner as unreflective as reflective, the child felt at his core two contradictory things as to what this living together could signify. On the one hand, that he could betray his own, his own, his close ones, and Judaism, and that he had to vow this within himself, even before others, even before God, but also, on the other hand, that by this separation, this rupture, this passage toward a kind of universality beyond symbiotic communitarism and gregarious fusion, fusion, beyond even citizenship, and we lost our citizenship during the war, 
in this very separation, it could be that he was more faithful to a certain Jewish vocation at the risk of remaining the only, the last and the least of the Jews in the most ambiguous sense of this expression, which he played without playing elsewhere and 50 years later, presenting himself or sometimes also hiding himself as a kind of paradoxical Marano, then who ran the risk of losing. This child had to begin, uh, had to begin believing, and he no doubt never finished thinking that any living together supposes and guards as its very condition the possibility of this singular secret, inviolable separation, from which alone a stranger accords himself to a stranger in hospitality. To recognize that one lives together will then only with and as a stranger, a stranger at home, chez soi, in all the figures of the at home, that there is living together only there where the whole ensemble um, <coughs> is never ne neither formed nor closed, ne se forme et ne se ferme pas. There where the living together ensemble, the adverb, contests the completion, the closure, and the co cohesiveness of an ensemble, the noun the substantive of a substantial, closed, ensemble identical to itself, to recognize that there is living together only there where, in the name of promise and of memory, of the messianic and of mourning without work, without work of mourning, and without healing, it welcomes dissymmetry, anachrony, non-reciprocity with an, another who is greater at once older and younger than it another who comes or will come perhaps who has perhaps already come here is the justice of a law above laws here is a paradox that i believe coherent with what we were saying a moment ago of it living together that does not allow itself to be contained, exhausted, or governed, either in a natural or organic, genetic or biologic whole, or in a juridical institutional one. And this, whatever the name one gives to these natural or institutional wholes, organism, family, neighborhood, uh, nation, nation state, with their territorial space, or time of their history. Levinas recalled the bond between Jewish universalism and the respect of the stranger in his lesson entitled Toward the Other, with the commentary of a text from Tractate Yoma around Teshuvah, precisely. A lesson that I will not have time to interrogate in my turn with the attentiveness it I would have liked. Uh, I quote, the respect for the stranger, he says, within us, and the sanctification of the name of the eternal, the eternal, eternal are strangely equivalent. And all the rest is a dead letter. All the rest is literature. The image of God is better honored in the right given to the stranger than in symbols. Universalism bursts the letter apart, for it lay... I'm saying this second, that I have been able to perceive and to rejoice at this, uh, at this during my last visit to Israel and to Palestine, that these questions, these returns, these reflections, repentances, conscious realizations, upon certain founding violences 
are today more frequent and declared by certain Israelis, citizens and authentic patriots, and by new historians of the state of Israel, the ones and the others having decided to draw political consequences from this return to the past, as some Palestinians do as well. The child of whom I speak and who makes me speak understood in growing up that any juridical political founding of a living together is by essence violent, since it inaugurates there where a law, a droit, a right, did not yet exist. The founding of, of a state, or of a constitution, therefore, of a living together according to a state of law, an état de droit, is always, first of all, a non-legal violence. Not illegal, but non-legal. Otherwise put, unjustifiable with regard to an existing law, since the law is inexistent. There, where it is a matter of creati creating it. No state has ever been founded without this violence. No more Israel than France than the United States. Whatever form and whatever time it might have taken. But the child of whom I speak asked himself whether the founding of the modern state of Israel, with all the politics and policies that have followed and confirmed it, could be, more, could be no more than an example, among others, of this originary violence from which no state can escape, or whether, because this modern state intended not to be a state like others, it had to appear before another law and appeal to another justice. I recall this here, this classical question because I intend to take into consideration in a moment a certain globalization of law and of sins of repentance or of forgiveness asked for when the, end, when the instance in front of which this appearance is instituted is no longer nas national or belonging to the state. If I let a Jewish child speak it is neither to move you uh, cheaply, nor to shelter provocations behind an alibi. Rather, it is to convince you that my questions, my reticences, my impatiences, my indignation sometimes, for example, when faced with the politics of almost all the Israeli governments and the forces that support them from within and from without, are not inspired by hostility or by the indifference of distance. On the contrary, shared with so many Israelis who are exposed and concerned otherwise than I am, and together with so many Jews in the world, this innocent concern for compassion, a fundamental mode in my view of living together, of this compassion of justice and equity, rahabim, as we say in Hebrew, perhaps, I will claim, I will claim it, if not as the essence of Judaism, at least as what remains in me inseparable from the suffering and disarmed memory of the Jewish child, there where he has learned to name justice and what injustice at once exceeds and demands law, exceeds and demands law, the droit. Everything comes to me, no doubt, from this source in what I am about to say under the title Avowing the Impossible. Avowing the Impossible, this can signify at once one must avow and therefore avow the unavowable. And this avowing of the unavowable remains perhaps impossible, but of an impossibility that must be rendered manifest, even and precisely if it appears impossible. Put otherwise, the truth is that one must do the impossible, and the impossible would perhaps be the only measure of any must 
in full. How and why grant today such privilege to the avowing of the unavowable? Since I have chosen to place this address under the sign of the avowal, you have the right to ask me why I am about to do in such a paradoxical and suspicious fashion to the point why I am about to do so in such a paradoxical and suspicious fashion to the point of declaring the command to avow to be as necessary as impossible. The choice of this theme was an election and therefore a selection, therefore an exclusion that I could not justify in a rational fashion, but for which I would account in a solely economic and conditional mode. And these two I must avow. Economical and conditional. Because I have committed myself to treating an infinite enigma giving together for an hour and a few minutes on such a topic. This is the time of one of those telegrams that one no longer sends. And to do so in a language shared by all of us who are here together, first response to any injunction of the living together, and so a language that resists my temptation, and first of all, the temptation that would consist in wagering on the double and abyssal memory that opens upon the immense question of living together by multiplying allusions to, uh, uh, on the side of the philosophical memory, to, from Aristotle, Rousseau, uh, to Kant, Heidegger, Husserl, Marx, Nietzsche, Levinas, and so on, to the metaphysics of, uh, or to the ontology of being with mid uh, to the socius, to the intersubjectivity, the phenomenological constitution of the, uh, the transcendental alter ego, to the social bond, and the dissociation, to the relation without relation to the other, to Blanchot's uh, unavowable community, or Nancy's in, inoperative community, and etc., etc. And how to faithfully treat at this rhythm a tradition of Jewish thought on the topic of living together, but also on the return, repentance, pardon, reconciliation, and reparation of teshuva or tikkun in the treasure of canonical texts or their repetition by Leo Beck, for example, Herman Cohen or Emmanuel Levinas. If I have chosen the theme of a vowel, that is first of all because of what is occurring today in the world. General rehearsal, repetition, scene, even a theatrical rendering of vowel, of return and of repentance, seems to me to signify a mutation in process. Agile one, to be sure, fleeting and difficult to interpret, but like the moment of, an, of the relations, relations between community, civil society, and the state, between sovereign states, international law, non-governmental organizations, between the ethical, the juridical, and the political, between the public and the private, between national citizenship and international citizenship, even a meta-citizenship, in a word, concerning a social bond which crosses the borders of these ensembles called family, nation, state, sometimes accompanied by what one names rightly or wrongly repentance, sometimes preceded or accompanied by what one believes rightly or wrongly uh, 
must condition them, namely confession, repentance, forgiveness asked for, sins of a vowel, are multiplied and have been accelerating for a few years in truth and have been uh, have been accelerating in the public space transformed by pirate technologies and by mediatic capital by the speed of the and the reach of communication but also by the multiple effects of a technology of a techno politics and uh, techno genetics that unsettle bouleverse at once all conditions conditions of being together the supposed proximity in the same instant in the same place in the same territory as if the unicity of a place on earth of the soil were becoming more and more as one says on a telephone and then and in the measure of the said telephone portable portable the soil becomes portable and the condition of the living in its technological relation to the non-living to hetero or homo grafting to prosthesis artificial insemination cloning etc largely exceeding the territory of the state and of the nation all these scenes of avowal and of re-examination of past crimes appeal to the testimony even to the judgment of a community and so of a modality of the living together virtually universal but also virtually instituted as an infinite court or a world world confessional i could recall a great number of different but analogous examples and intentionally juxtapose the most heterogeneous cases from the memorable gesture of the one in the front in front of the monument of the Warsaw ghetto the fa famous declaration of the bishops of Poland and Germany at the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz that of the French church of the corporations of physicians and the police in France to the speeches of heads of state such as Jacques Chirac who declared that France had committed the, I quote, irreparable, irreparable. In all these cases, it is a matter of crimes against humanity from which Jews were not the only ones suffering, but of which they were massively the designated victims and always named in these declarations of guilt. As problematic as it remains, and whatever the elaborations it still calls for the concept of crime against humanity created as you know by the international court of nuremberg in 1945 is the juridical mechanism of this globalization of avowal the unprecedented event unprecedented unprecedented event affects at its root a condition of living together but it also marks the after effect of a moment in the history of humanity that keeps the wound of the shore even if it is, if it is not of course reducible to that this advance of a new juridical concept is the very memory of the shore i would go so far as to say since I cannot cite so many analogous examples, that the promises of the Vatican regarding the examination of conscience as to the Inquisition is inseparable from the same presupposition, I mean, from the bottomless trauma of the shore, of its memory, whether assumed or denied. This globalization of the vowel is therefore not thinkable in its inaugural emergence without what happened to the Jews in Europe in the 20th century. Nor is it any more separable from the international recognition of the State of Israel, a legitimation I would also interpret as one of the first moments, moments of this avowal and of this world's bad conscience. These acts of public repentance address themselves 
to crimes against the Jews, but one could just as well recall analogous declarations by Václav Havel towards the Sudetenland, by Prime Minister Muruyama in his own name a few years ago, and more recently in the name of the Japanese government as such towards the Koreans, not to speak of the Chinese, as well as what is happening at this very moment between the Chinese and the Japanese. Uh, by President Clinton also, not only regarding the sinister and significant matter of the impeachment, but first of all regarding the recognition in 1998 in Africa, without however any act of official contrition, of an American responsibility in the history of the African slave trade and the infinite violence of slavery, which like the violence done to Native Americans, is inseparable from the foundation of the United States. One thinks, above all, of that extraordinary Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, which was itself preceded by analogous, if not identical, institutions in Chile and Argentina. These, however, did not address violences and traumas affecting communities as different among themselves as in South Africa. These events have, to my knowledge, no antecedents in the history of humanity, in the history of states and of nation states, which thus find themselves appearing in courts, as it were, in front of an instance above the state, and yet all these scenes have in common a feature that is at once double and indivisible. On the one hand, their common presupposition will have been the possibility opened after the world, world War II of recognizing and judging in front of an international instance Nazi violence, and in it, the extermination project called Holocaust, which aimed explicitly and in the first place as the Jews, the Gypsies, and homosexuals. On the other hand, and with the aim of making this extermination project appear before a universal jurisdiction, the creation of the Nuremberg Court and the institutional, the institutional, the institution uh, in international law of the new concept of crime against humanity, which France in 1964 declare and source imprescriptible, meaning in, in American, uh, beyond states of limitation. As problematic and insufficient as it remains, in my view, as I have said, this concept announces an irreversible progress. It is implied in all the scenes of repentance, of avowal, and of forgiveness asked for. For example, the global and local fight for the abolition of apartheid, followed by the institution of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, were possible only because of the official recognition of apartheid as a crime against humanity by the United Nations among others. This international juridical uh, act provides a reference on whose basis the Commission grants itself its authority. It articulates a logic signifying that any state racism, which they're living together, that called itself apartheid, was, it was a living, a way of living together, state racism. Any racism and any segregation based on birth, where it is encouraged or permitted in the laws of the state, is a crime against humanity. As imperfect as it remains, this concept is on the horizon of all the progresses to come of international law, of the difficult but irresistible institutional, institutional international courts, as well as the practical setting to work of any declaration of the rights of man, something that still remains largely to come if one considers the 
incommensurable inequalities in the living conditions of men. Not to speak of what in the life of what are called animals and in the living together with the living ones that are called in undifferentiated fashion animals. But there is also a living together with animals calls up tasks that, that exceeds that exceed even the concepts of law and of duty and would have to obligate us to rethink the great question of sacrifice. I ask them to conclude with the consequences that follow. And I will draw in general lines a series of contradictions that not only do not forbid living together, but were they to be declared or avowed, would on the contrary provide the condition of living together and the chance of a responsibility. First, a paria. On the one hand, we know that the globalization of avowal, of repentance, and of return upon past crimes, with or without forgiveness asked for, can indeed dissimulate facilities, alibis, perverse strategies, and instrumentalization, a comedy, or a calculation. It calls then for an endless vigilance. Yet, it nonetheless resembles those events in which, in which a thinker of the Enlightenment, Kant in this case, thought he recognized at least the sign, at least the possibility of an irreversible progress of humankind. It marks a beyond of national law, even the beyond of a politics measured only by the sovereignty of the nation state. And we could mention all what happened during the last year. Nation states, institutions, corporations, armies, churches, must appear before a court. Sometimes former heads of state or military leaders must give account, whether willingly or not, in front of instances that are in principle universal, in front of an international law that does not, does not cease to be refined and to consolidate new non-governmental powers to force belligerent parties to recognize their past crimes and to negotiate over the peace of a new living together, to judge in exemplary fashion governing individuals, dictators or not, while being careful not to forget the states, sometimes foreign states, that have sustained or manipulated them the important signal constituted by the removal of Pinochet's immunity would have to go far beyond his own person and even beyond his own country. You know what I mean. More generally, with all the questions that these developments leave open, what one calls, what one calls humanitarian intervention is not the only space of such new interventions. <clears throat> But, on the other hand, if one must salute this progress that sketches a beyond of state national sovereignty, and even of the political itself, in as much as it remains since the beginning, in fact, coextensive with the state and with the exercise of citizenship, one can also see emerging possible perversions of this progress. Not only a legalism that replaces politics, politique, a reduction of justice to law, a surreptitious appropriation of the universal juridical powers. There is no enforcing law without a force of application. As the same Kant reminded us uh, with good sense. The logic of the alibi, alibi or of the scapegoat in the determination of the accused subjects, a hijacking of international law 
by different forces or camps, by economic or state national powers, which would submit this exercise of law and even, and even so-called humanitarian action to unjust strategies and to a disguised politics before which the recourse to the sovereignty of the nation state would sometimes, would sometimes have to remain an irreducible site of resistance. All the more so since this new legalism sustained by technological resources of investigation, communication, ubiquity, and unprecedented speed runs the risk of reconstituting under the pretext of transparency a new inquisitorial obsession that transforms anybody into a subject or a defendant summoned to live together according to the ensemble while renouncing not only to what one names with the old name of private life, the invisible practice of faith, but also and quite simply while renouncing this possibility of the secret of separation, of solitude, of silence, and of singularity, of this interruption that remains, we've seen, the inalienable condition of living together, of responsibility and decision, and of decision. Were the, the time given to me, I would have offered, in order to sharpen the blade of this aporia, a reading for today of what happened in the silence of the, and the secret of, the, of a certain Abraham on Mo, Mount Moria from this perspective. If these two exigencies and these two antinomic risks are indisputable and so grave, there are no knowable and prior norms to regulate or resolve our response. The responsibility for the most just decision must be invented each time in a unique fashion by each one in a singular time and place. To hold myself to the letter of our, of our theme, well then for the living together that I'm proposing, we think beyond any ensemble, there is no how. There is in any case no how that could take the form of concepts, precepts, rules, of norms, or previous criteria available to a knowledge. The how must be invented by each at each moment. There would be no singular responsibility if a how were available in advance, the knowledge of a rule or of a rule to be simply applied. What I'm saying here is anything but empirical or relativistic. It responds to what I hold as the most demanding in ethical experience. One must then at least begin to declare this antinomy, to recognize and acknowledge, acknowledge, to vow it to oneself, to vow it before the other, every other, before the stranger, and even before the enemy. There where it seems unavowable, and because it is unavowable, one must recognize and acknowledge this division, this steering, this rift, this dissociation from oneself, this difficulty of living together with oneself, to gather in an ensemble, in a totality of cohesiveness and coherence, the first step of a living together will always remain rebellious to totalization. Another aporia, second, runs the risk of paralyzing this movement. The ethics of forgiveness is, I believe, profoundly divided by two heterogeneous motives of the Abrahamic, Jewish, Christian, or Islamic tradition, which has bequeathed it to us without wanting to reduce these three legacies to the same, far from it, and without being able here to involve myself in the treatment uh, that this immense question would deserve, without stopping either at the profound 
actually a Galian Christianization that marks the language of this globalization of the vowel. There is here an effect of what I have called globalization in process, the mondialization en cours, and not only in law. I will mention only one paradox. The heirs that we are feel that the movement of forgiveness is found between two logics, at once heterogeneous to each other and yet indissociable. On the one hand, there should be forgiveness only under the form of a gracious, unconditional, free, infinite, and unilateral gift without an economic circle of reciprocity. That is to say, even there where the other does not expiate, does not repent, and therefore even the living together does not inscribe itself in a horizon of reconciliation, of reparation, of healing, of indemnification, and of redemption. And unconditional forgiveness is an absolute initiative that no calculation, whether sublime or spiritual, should motivate. But on the other hand, the same tradition, Abrahamic tradition, the same tradition reminds us in a prevalent, dominant, and hegemonic fashion this time, that forgiveness can be granted only in a conditional fashion. There where, the, where, where there is acknowledgement of a fault, a vowel, repentance, return upon the past, present or future transformation, forgiveness asked for. Although in his book on forgiveness, Le Pardon, Vladimir Yankelevich has spoken of a hyperbolic ethics of forgiveness, he nonetheless firmly declared, especially during the time when in France one was debating the imprescriptibility of crimes against humanity, he uh, declared that forgiveness would not be granted to those who never asked for it by pleading guilty. I quote, forgiveness died in the death camps, he had already said, in a less polemical mode in his theological book on forgiveness. What sense, indeed, would forgiveness have there where the guilty one does not await it and, first of all, does not know or acknowledge the crime? This strong logic, this economy, precisely where it seems to me hardly compatible with this other postulation of unconditional forgiveness. We know that, it, that this strong logic dominates, even if it, is, it does not exert them, both the Abrahamic traditions, Jewish, Christian, Islamic, and the actual politics of forgiveness. At the very moment when he recalls that the principle, I quote, the principle of Jewish forgiveness, and, and of course, becomes, I quote again, a pure rule unanimously acknowledged by man, by man and by him uniquely before the Lord, unquote, Herman Cohen does not dissociate forgiveness from repentance. With this forgiveness, which is, he says, explicitly designed as the objective of the Torah, he then associates, as if it were one and the same thing, teshuva, which he recalls designates repentance and means return, turning backwards, change, return to the good, return to, uh, to oneself. The instigator of sacrificial worship is also herald of the repentance that figures as a major act in any ethics and at the core of any divine worship, and of course. Even, I quote again, even God cannot redeem me, Cohen dares to say, without my own moral efforts and repentance. As legitimate as it may seem, and I do not want to denounce it, this placing under condition of the unconditional governs the, practice, the practices of a forgiveness there where the latter remains nonetheless heterogeneous in its unconditionality to all these orders, 
ethical, political, juridical, and to the goals of reconciliation, reparation, amnesty, or prescription. One recognizes the figure of cure, of self-healing, and of living together in the South African discourse of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, above all where it is moderated and interpreted, interpreted in a Christian sense by this one to two. Something that forces us to ask ourselves whether the globalization of the vowel is a planetarization of the Abrahamic concepts, or more specifically, the Christian concepts of forgiveness, or on the contrary, a new mutation that brings about something unexpected, something even threatening to this tradition, I cannot engage here this necessary but immense question. What the South African example brings into evidence is a process of repentance, of amnesty or prescription, which one confuses too quickly with forgiveness, a work of mourning that one interprets as healing away, that, that's uh, the current expression, the uh, usual expression, healing away, an act of memory as healing which overcomes the trauma and enables wounded communities to be together. One dreams, of course, that other wounded countries, each in its own way, might be inspired by this motive of reconciliation, literally inscribed in the foreword of the South African Constitution, in spite of all the ambiguities of which I speak. But as equivocal and as conditional as it is, as threatening as it is to the purity of forgiveness, this motive of healing is not only at the heart of the dominant interpretation of forgiveness, one finds it operating at the heart of the great Jewish reflections on Teshuvah in this century. One could cite not only Beck, Cohen, and Buber, but also Scheller, another Catholic of Jewish origins, whose repentance as Selbstheilung of the soul, self-healing of the soul. Under the sign of Teshuva, of what the translation as return relation with God, and absolutely, to quote, out of the internal event, Levinas appeals to what he calls unconditional justice in his text on Tractate Yoma. But he nonetheless submits forgiveness to condition and asks, asks that it be asked for, I quote, that there can be no forgiveness that the guilty party has not sought. The guilty party must recognize his fault. The offended party must want to receive the entities of the offending party. Further, no person can forgive if forgiveness has not been asked of him by the offender if the guilty party has not tried to appease the offender, unquote. And here too, I won't follow the subtle trajectory of this meditation, all the paths and the voices that les voix et les voix that cross each other in it, all the way to the double limit where recalling what he calls the conditions of forgiveness, Levinas quickly evokes the essential possibility of the offending one's unconscious, which should bring one to conclude, I quote, in essence, forgiveness is impossible because of the unconscious. In, in essence, forgiveness is impossible. Levinas also evokes in passing, still a bit furtively perhaps, another border, decisive one, to my mind, a limit touched upon by an opinion that was preserved in the Gemara, that of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who speaks of a purifying forgiveness on the day of Kippur, Yom Kippur, without Teshuvah, without repentance, forgiveness without repentance. And on the edge of that limit, in an elliptical text that remained unpublished in his lifetime, on the uh, title Signification of Time in the Moral world, world, and on the Last Judgment, Walter Benjamin, too, spoke of a storm of divine forgiveness 
which blows to its own limit, but without merging with the movement or, or an economy of reconciliation. A forgiveness, vergebung, without reconciliation, versöhnung. Beyond its legal code <coughs> and its penal limits, the concept of inscriptibility, imprescriptibility, beyond statute of limitation, signals toward a last judgment. Until the end of times, the criminal, the dictator, torturer, nation state guilty of crimes against humanity, etc., will have to appear before a court and give account. There is no longer an end to responsibility that the guilty one could assume, ever. It is of this impossible that I would have wanted to speak as the only chance of forgiveness in all of its ethical and political consequences. It is similar to the avowable and the unavowable. If I avow only what is avowable, I am not avowing. To avow is to avow the unavowable, much like forgiving is forgiving the, unforg the unforgivable, that is, doing the impossible. Well then, since I will never feel justified in renouncing the necessity of a forgiveness condition, uh, conditioned upon repentance, nor in renouncing the demand without demand and without duty and without debt of the unconditional forgiveness that gives its sense to any pure, pure thought of forgiveness, the only responsibility I cannot escape is to declare to the other this dilemma, dilemma. It is to take the initiative, as I do here, of this declaration and to commit myself to drawing its juridical, political, ethical, and historical consequences. By reason of what I have just said, I must do so alone. And even if I am the only one to take this initiative, without expecting reciprocity. Alone, and there where I am irreplaceable in this responsibility. It is thus that I understand or accept the concept of election. There where being chosen well beyond any privilege of birth, nation, people, or community. Being chosen signifies that no one can replace me at the site of this decision and of this responsibility. And this does not erase, on the contrary, the transgenerational and our collective responsibility that torment the sleep of innocence. Third, I'm almost finished. One would then have to avow a third aporia of living together. I will never be able to renounce and to say no, to say no to a preference for my own, les miens nor inversely to justify it, to have it approved as the law of a universal justice. Those whom I call in this undeniable but unjustifiable hierarchy my own are not those who belong to me. It is the answerable of those with whom precisely it is given to me prior to any choice. It is the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it is the ensemble of those who, with whom precisely it is given to me prior to any choice to live together in all the dimensions of what one calls so easily a community, my family, my congeners, my countrymen, co-religionists, my neighbors, my close ones, those who speak my language, and I would go so far as to say my neighbor. There were these, where these words in the biblical tradition can designate as well the distant stranger, but on the condition that he be my fellow man, mon semblable, an, uh, a man, another man, a, a man, brother in humanity. How to renounce it, but also how to justify my preference for all the forms of the proximate, of this proximity, which at the limit in situations of mortal danger would carry me, would carry me to rescue of my children rather than of those of another. 
rather than to rescue, to the rescue of all those others who are not only my others, to the rescue of man rather than an animal, and even of my cat rather than a cat unknown to me and dying in Asia. In the eyes of justice or of universal equality, how to justify a preference for one's own children, a preference for, for one's own parents and friends, even a preference of, among one's own as far as death and ultimate sacrifice, the privilege of Isaac, for example, rather than Ishmael. My own do not belong to me, nor does my home, chez moi, belong to me. So go the declensions of the first person, belonging of belonging, l'appartenir de l'appartenance, living together. I belong to that which does not belong to me, to my own, to language, a site, to a my home, that do not belong to me, and which I will never possess. Belonging excludes any absolute appropriation, even the radical right of property. How then to deny, but also how to justify the interior urgency that will make me first nourish my own, the proximate or the neighbor, before rushing to rescue the billions of famished men in the world. For the eloquent and meticulous militants of the rights of men and of social struggles in their countries should never forget that never in the entire history of humanity have so many men on earth been lacking bread and drinkable water and that indifference or passivity on this subject and other analogous subjects is the beginning of a crime against humanity, a transgression of you, of you shall not kill. And wh whoever says you shall not kill, if he restricts himself to my neighbor, my brother, my fellow man, man, simply man, also avows what a paradox, the accepted murder of all living others in general, to wit, what one names stupidly and confused the, the animal. Well, then, this preference, this hierarchy, can give itself distinct manners, brutal or distinguished, odious or refined. No one will ever be able to deny it in all good faith, nor renounce it. But no one will ever be able to justify it either, what one calls justifying, judging and proving that it is just before a universal justice. In this regard, I will always be indebted and will always be failing to fulfill the first duty. This, to avow this aporia does not suffice, but it is the first condition of a responsible lucidity and the first gesture to open the best possible negotiation, to invent and unilaterally to propose its rule to the stranger, to the unknown one, to the other, even to the enemy, beyond even the neighbor, the fellow man, and the brother, all the way to the point where living together commits life to all the living, to the gaze of all the living, to the gaze and even beyond the gaze, and even there where no sacrifice can leave my conscience at rest as soon as one falls or assails the life of a living other, I mean, of an animal, human or not. What remains unjustifiable in all good faith remains, therefore, in as much as unjustifiable remains unforgivable and, therefore, unavowable. And it is, therefore, that which I must begin by avowing. All these aporias obey a common economy which is one, which is none other than economy itself, oikonomia, the law of the house, of the proper oikos, and of property. And one would have had to associate this motive of ecology, this large and new dimension of living together with the motive of economy. My last example concerns the relation between the living in the genetic or biozoological sense and technology more than ever, an everyday 
faster than ever. The techno-scientific and genetical industrial intervention upon the fetal cell, the genome, the fertility process, homo or hetero grafts, etc. Much like the deployment of so many prosthetic structures obligate us to re-elaborate the very norms of our elementary perception as to what is an ensemble or an organic identity, the living together of a proper body. For a proper body is first of all a, a manner of being together, sim symbiotically with oneself and in proximity, a symbiosis that here too we can neither deny nor justify. Well then, the technological resources that affect the globalization of avowal by transforming the public space, informatization, panoptimization of telephonic and televis televisual digital communication, are the same technological resources that engage the living, all the synthesis of the living, all the dimensions of the living, being together with oneself or with the other in the space at the time of a techno-biological prosthesis that, here again, we can neither love nor reject, neither desire nor refuse, neither justify nor condemn in principle. If it interrupts the naturality of the ensemble, technology is nevertheless, since always, the very condition of this living together that it constantly threatens. It is death in life, a condition of life. That chance should also be a threat. Here is what one must acknowledge, a vow. Here is what, that for which one must begin to respond precisely there where, like the avowal of the unavowable, the forgiveness of the unforgivable, uh, <clears throat> appears both impossible and the only possibility of forgiveness. Forgiving only what is that which is forgivable is not forgiven. Here too, there could be no how that would proceed as with the knowledge, the decision or responsibility whose rule each one singularly chosen without election, chosen to an irreplaceable place must invent. As linked to my conclusion, in the ellipsis of an image and the furtive passage of a memory, I will gather one question which never waits, the waiting without waiting of these four aporias from which, that is to say also from Jerusalem, I address myself to you. It is very close to Mount Moria, where Kierkegaard said, that is his fiction, where Kierkegaard said that Abraham was tempted to ask God for forgiveness, but he would have, according to Kierkegaard in this fiction, he would have asked him for forgiveness not for having failed at his absolute duty toward God, but rather for having attempted to obey God absolutely and blindly, and so for having preferred his unconditional duty to the life of his own, to his preferred son. Abraham would thus have had this movement, according to Kierkegaard, to ask for forgiveness of God for having obeyed him. <laughs>